America's children are under attack. We all know it. I don't care who you voted for. They're taught that there is no such thing as truth. Gender, it's malleable. Racism can never be overcome. These things are not true. The question is, why are they being taught? Why are our schools more interested in critical race theory or any critical theory more than arithmetic? Why are parents blocked from intervening in their own child's education? Why are they fighting for pornography in school libraries? Are our kids being groomed for a Marxist takeover? Well, the answers are here. A staunch defender of our liberty and our kids. The new book is called Hide Your Children, Exposing the Marxists Behind the Attack on America's Kids. There are very few books that I read about progressivism or history where I actually learn uh, uh, quite a lot. This is one of those books, really well written by today's conservative commentator, author, and mother. And guest on today's podcast, Liz Wheeler. Before we get to Liz, it is never fun to think about the unthinkable, but we have to. Somebody's got to do it. We have to preserve as much as we can as families and as communities. And if disaster strikes, someone's got to make sure that you and your family have everything you need. And it ain't going to be the government. The top of that list is food and water. Always better to have it and not need it rather than need it and not have it. Fortunately, you know the place to go. It is My Patriot Supply, the nation's leader in high-quality emergency food. I keep it on hand. Well, I did, and then I lost it all in a boating accident. But you should, too. Head on over to MyPatriotSupply.com and prepare today with emergency food that will stay fresh for up to 25 years. Wide variety of foods. It's really, really good. I mean, I can't believe that it's emergency food. It's really good. Uh, and you can find it now at MyPatriotSupply.com. MyPatriotSupply.com. Welcome. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, I will tell you. You had me at the Woodrow Wilson bashing. I mean, anyone who can bash Woodrow Wilson, and you're one of the best ones, uh, is all right in my book. I want to talk to you about him um, uh, as, as we go through. But there's so much to learn in your book, and you've done such a great job of tracking it from the beginning. And once you, once you understand the roots and you see the real evil root, it's pretty easy to see where we're going and what the real objective is, isn't it? It is. One of the things that would constantly hit home to me when I was writing this book, you know, late nights of researching for a year, is once you see this stuff, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. And you see the manifestation of it everywhere. And yeah. one of the things I think that conservatives forget because we so often um, accuse and rightfully so the mainstream media and Democrats of lying. We dismiss all of their fake news and their Correct. false narratives is they actually at the same time do tell us exactly what their goal is and how right? they're going to accomplish it. Yes. And we forget to believe them. I know it's, it's so incredible, especially lately how clear it all is. I mean, they do tell us every step of the way exactly what they're going to do. And then people claim it's a conspiracy. Yeah. No, no, they just said that. And with history, you know they actually mean it. So who are we facing? What is, what is attacking us right now? Particularly what's attacking our children are the forces of Marxism. And I don't mean that just in the philosophical way. I mean actual Marxists, people who believe that we should overthrow capitalism, people who believe that we should impose communism on the United States, people who believe in the downfall of Western civilization are using our children to try to cause chaos in our society, to destroy our civil institutions, which are our cultural institutions, in order to destabilize the entire rule of law and fabric of the United States of America 
to then be able to have access to toppling the governmental institutions. Show, give me a name and the most obvious example of that. Sure. So one of the things that I did in my book is I identified the origin of the ideas. So basically Marxists that are long dead. Right. I said, these are the these are the guys that coined this. These are guys that designed the strategy. Mm -hmm. It's a little hard, I think, to feel a concrete connection to that because mm -hmm. Paulo Freire, for example, he mean, he's been dead for generations, mm -hmm. but his ideas are being propagated by people alive and well today people and organization. So one of the most obvious examples that's been in the news lately is the president of the American Library Association, mm -hmm. Emily Drabinsky, who she's in the news because she's defending pornographic books being in children's school and material that that indoctrinates in critical race theory. But the day that she won that position in the American Library Association's the top position, she tweeted, who would have thought that a Marxist could win this position? She is a it's it's not me using this word to describe her based on her ideology. It's her admitting what her ideology is. And she's an incredibly powerful person. The president of the American Library Association mm -hmm. makes decisions about what our children are going to be reading if they go to public schools. And one of the things I track in my book is it's not just her in and of, in and of herself. The reason that she won that election is because Randy Weingarten threw all of her political support behind Drabinsky's campaign. What what is, I mean, I see this and I see they are destroying absolutely everything. And, you know, I, I talk to people all the time from all sides and they're saying a lot of the same things lately. And that is just got to burn the whole thing down. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's a, this took a long time. You know, our, our, one of our main, uh, attraction to foreign uh, investors, business, our foreigners, is that we're stable. And we've had a constitution, the average constitution lasts 17 years. Okay, we're stable. You don't just throw this away. So what is it that these people like Wendy, Randy Weingarten, what is she seeing the future? What does she see? is coming that what are they building well i assume with randy weingarten she's tipped her hand she while she probably wouldn't admit to being a marxist she embraces the marxist ideology mm -hmm. but one of the things you said is actually very interesting because it's not just the left that is saying burn it down yes. there are people on the right who think that our system has failed because we exist in this moment of cultural chaos where you know trans ideology is so prevalent, critical race theory is everywhere, DEI is in every corporate boardroom, everything's governed by ESG. It's a, it's a, quite a time to be alive. It is. A lot of Republicans are saying, well, maybe there's something wrong with our system if it allowed us to get to this point. Maybe we should totally retool. And the second half of my book is a critique of the Republican Party. Not, not Democrats, the first half is talking about the left, but the Republican Party made a very critical mistake 50 or 60 years ago in how they fought back against this. Because this cultural chaos we're living in right now is not new. No. This, is, this is not something that we just discovered during COVID. Mm -hmm. Our eyes might have been opened because we saw it for ourselves, mm -hmm. but this has been planted in our institutions since essentially the 1960s or before, mm -hmm. but Republicans refused to see that. We had our head in the sand while the Marxists were subverting and infiltrating and plotting to overthrow these institutions. And the response from the Republican Party was to think of the United States, you and I sitting here, we think of the United States as a free country, mm -hmm. but the Republican Party looks at this idea of a free country and they define freedom as the ultimate end. This is what this is what we're working towards. Freedom is this ultimate morality. And that's not correct. Freedom, as defined in our Constitution, is the means to something greater. But the Republican Party, when we embraced this idea that freedom is the ultimate end, it led us to a position where when David French said drag queen story hour is a blessing of liberty. Well, if these grown men who are dressed up in sexual as sexualized versions of women gyrating in front of children, freedom is the ultimate end, then. They have the freedom to do that. There must be some kind of inherent morality Correct. to that. You and I know that that's grotesque and evil and there's not. So freedom must be the means to something greater. And I challenge conservatives and Republicans to grapple with this question. Well, what is the something greater? What do we want our society to be? What does it mean when we say we are we are ordering our society towards human flourishing? And the Republican Party has led us um, 
I want to say towards libertarianism, but I don't say that with animosity. I think we yeah, all yeah. had libertarian yeah. leanings when we were younger. Um, but they've led us towards this um, place where we've fallen prey to the idea that there can be neutrality in institutions. So Republicans have pulled back any semblance of identifying what's right or wrong in our legislative efforts or in our cultural efforts just to be fair so that everybody's values are respected. And meanwhile, the Democrats swoop in and they codify their values and their mm-hmm. beliefs. So if we are going to actually recapture these institutions, protect our kids, stop the insanity that's happening in our country, we have to think as a movement and as a party in a much more philosophical and broader sense about what our goal is. So I want to go back to that, but um, how much, for instance, I'm sorry, teachers, but if you're a member of the teachers union, you're part of the problem. You can't look at me and say, no, I am fighting. No, you're not. You're sending part of your money to those guys. You, at some point, you have to get up and say, this is evil. I can't have any part of it. Um, how many of the people that are involved in this, what's the percentage do you think of, they know what they're doing, they're true believers, and they're marching towards that? And then the percentage of those who are like, I, I don't, I just don't want to get lose my job and I'm not really looking. And then people who are just absolutely blind. Well, for the general public, I would say you can think of it like a cult setup, if you will. I know that's a funny analogy, but in a cult, there's like the person or the people at the top who know exactly what they believe and they know that it doesn't work. They just know that it'll serve them. Then like the level down from that, you have maybe the academic class who actually think believes those ideas. They believe that it will work. And then the step down below that is is the water carriers, the people that don't understand any of the philosophical stuff. They're just harnessed to be the mouthpieces. I think in our country, the majority of leftists, even those who have bought into some wokeness, are probably water carriers. They're probably not committed Marxists, maybe not teachers in, in all the teachers in schools with the exception of the blue haired teachers on TikTok and <laughs> and those folks. Right. But I think most of our country is not corrupted. Most of the people in our country aren't corrupted with Marxism because we wouldn't have this outcry or this backlash from parents about critical race theory and about transgender ideology if these people were committed Marxists. Because a lot of times people, even if they're not particularly political, maybe even if they're not particularly religious, they can still just based on human reason can point to something and say, wait a second, that's bad and evil to tell a white child that they're racist just because they're white. And it's bad and evil to tell a black child that they're oppressed just because they're black. That's what we've seen in the last two years. Parents who aren't conservative activists who are saying, I know that's bad. I can't necessarily tell you the origin of it, but I don't want my child taught that. Those people aren't committed Marxists, even if they voted for Democrats, even if they have they, them in their profile. They just don't know exactly what How they're do doing. How do you break the spell of that? I mean, I keep, I keep wondering every day. I read something, and maybe it's just because I pay attention to the news, but I read something. I'm like, how do people, for instance, drag queen story hour, eight years ago, five years ago, everyone, everyone would have said, No, that's bad. Uh, Normalizing pedophilia. No, that's bad. Getting children sexualized five years ago. No, that's bad. There's been no new scientific information whatsoever. It has only been say it or else. What is it going to take for people to wake up? Or are they just afraid? Some people are afraid. They don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose their social position. I would say the practical solution is twofold. First of all, when parents are told that critical race theory or the principles of it belong to a Marxist theory, they're like, I knew I was right. I knew I saw something that was evil. So part of it's just our efforts in, you know, screaming from the rooftops, guys, look at what's happening. See what the plan is. Listen to their own words. And that's very effective. The other part of this is conservatives for a long time have misunderstood the idea of limited government. We think of limited government as just being as small of government Mm -hmm. as possible. That's not what limited government means. It means limited by enumerated powers, limited by accountability to the people. And we've forgotten that there is just authority of government and that we should use the just authority to properly order our society. So when it comes to these two examples that we're discussing, critical race theory and trans theory, we should use the power of the government to ban critical race theory and trans the- transgender ideology in schools, in p- 
public libraries, any place that touches taxpayer money from the military, from the federal government. Private companies that have contracts with the government shouldn't be allowed to have DEI offices and all of these different things. We can use government to eradicate this from our institutions. Conservatives are just afraid to do that because the left tries to use our words against us and tries to say, oh, I thought you were for small government. Well, no, we're for a limited, a government limited by enumerated powers and accountability to the people. But it doesn't mean that we can't use it to order our society. Do you remember the day when you could do all the normal things you wanted to do without feeling like you were made entirely out of broken glass? My daughter has such a bad back because she, um, you know, kind of twisted herself during labor. Um, my hands were in so much pain, I could barely use them. I'm learning to play the piano now. There's no way I could have even thought of that a year ago. Living with pain is not a joke, but there is something that can maybe help you get out of pain. I discovered Relief Factor, and if you've been dealing with pain in your life, you feel like you've tried everything, because that's the way I felt. That's never going to work for me. It's all natural. It's gonna. This works for me. Ibuprofen does not work for me. I don't know if it works for you, but that attacks inflammation. So I've, all th- I've always thought inflammation stuff, that never works. This does because it attacks inflammation in our bodies, which is a major source of pain and disease. It attacks it four different directions. So just try it for three weeks. If it's working for you, you feel any different, keep taking it. If not, stop. In three weeks, you'll pretty much know. Trial pack, not a drug, so it's not going to whack you out. It's Relief Factor. Go to relieffactor.com, relieffactor.com, or call 800-4-RELIEF. I asked Donald Trump, I see what they're doing. You said, Donald Trump, you said, lock her up. And you didn't, because that was campaign this is really being the president. You don't want to start locking up opponents. But now they've done it to you. They're trying to lock you up. And they're serious about it. Are you going to lock them up if you get in? And he said, I have to. They started it. How, how do we? Because there's a lot. There's, we're in deep, deep trouble. How do we root this out? How do we use government but not set up a government that can – we have to stop going down one road and then four years later, eight years later, go, oh, we're going that way. The government makes no sense. It doesn't – how do we reroute ourselves? How do we unplug the system and plug it back in to restore factory settings? Well, first of all, that's Trump's answer is like the Trumpist answer right after they yeah, started. Yeah, it. That's yeah. funny. I actually think he probably should lo- have locked – Hillary up. Because I think so, too. This, this a is, fair trial. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Fair trial, of course. But she was guilty of all these things. Yes. Like Trump is not. That's that's the difference. Yes. So let me give you an example uh, from the education system, because I think conservatives, we're good faith people. We try to be honest. We try to be people of integrity. We want everyone to flourish. But the education system, for example, is an indoctrination center. That's pretty inarguable. It's being used right now to indoctrinate children in all kinds of Marxist theory and revisionist history and moral relativism. Like it is an indoctrination center. So what is our reaction as conservatives? Are we trying to make it a neutral playing field again? My argument would be, no, we're not. We should also use it as an indoctrination center because the public school system in our country was created to be used as an indoctrination center. It was never created just to be reading, writing, and arithmetic. It was created, I mean, compulsory education. To make new Americans. Yes, compulsory education started in Massachusetts in 1852 because there was an influx of Catholic immigrants at the time, and the politicians wanted to indoctrinate the children in American values so that they were loyal to America first and not Mm -hmm. their place of origin, Mm -hmm. and in Protestant values because they were anti-Catholic at Mm -hmm. the time. And what's funny is, again, conservatives lost sight of that was the purpose of the education system. There's nothing inherently immoral about indoctrination, it's a morally neutral concept. It's what is being indoctrinated that determines whether it's moral or immoral. So conservatives shouldn't just try to make education neutral. But we should indoctrinate. We... But this applies to this applies to the law too. So after Trump was indicted down in Georgia by this local DA, we recognize that oh, this is what George Soros why he was funding all these Correct. DAs because they knew the federal government 
Congress, you know, the Department of Justice was never going to be able to do this properly. They tried it with Trump with indictment or with impeachments and it didn't work. Humiliated him, maybe mostly galvanized his base. Mm -hmm. But my argument was, well, conservatives need to be doing this with DAs in red states, too. Why aren't we indicting Hunter Biden and Joe Biden on RICO charges? Amen. The difference is the Democrats are actually guilty of these things. So it's not us. It wouldn't be Republicans abusing their power. It would be us actually using the just authority that we have as government to hold people accountable when they violate the law. So it's not just, well, if the Democrats are going to do it, we're going to play by their rules, even though it's dishonest. It's totally different because using, indicting someone, for example, the morality of it is determined by whether you're weaponizing the government or whether you're following the rule of law. But I'm not sure we have enough Republicans, at least in leadership, that actually believe in anything like that. You know what I mean? The one thing about the left, the leadership, they believe. They believe. I don't, I don't know if Joe Biden even knows what he's doing, it, but the people behind him, they are true believers of what they're doing. Where I don't know if we have any real constitutionalists in, in the government now of any weight or number. We have a few that I know that stand up for it. Yeah. But it's not like a, oh, yeah, we're all constitutionalists here. Well, they don't understand what that means. So the reason the left is effective is because they are cohesive. And we as conservatives laugh at them for being so cohesive because we're like, well, don't you have any independent thoughts? Like, are you just one big block? That may be the wrong attitude to look at because they're actually just coalescing around a set of values and they are absolutely committed to achieving them. Now, we believe those values and those beliefs are evil. Republicans don't have a set of values because of what I described before. When you embrace the idea of libertarianism, you are not embracing, you don't, libertarianism isn't a belief in anything. It's trying to withdraw um, judgment or morality or objective truth from everything. So we've done this to ourselves. If we, if we wanted to be a cohesive party, then we would have a definition as a party of what human flourishing is. We would have a definition of liberty. We'd be like, well, what is liberty? Liberty is the means to something greater. What is this something greater? Justice? Well, what is justice? Well, justice, as defined by our Constitution, James Madison, in Federalist Paper Number 51, he defines liberty as justice. Edmund Burke defines justice as original justice, capital O, capital J. He means natural law. The Republican Party isn't coalesced around this belief. They're so afraid of an accusation of violating the separation of church and state that they're afraid of even appearing religious, of even their personal beliefs. So we're not going to be cohesive unless we decide what we believe as a party, because I don't think we believe anything as a party now. You are fantastic. You are just fantastic. Um, You give me hope on a day. I have had little hope. Thank you. But you give me hope. Um, Let me take you back to history. Uh, The guy who um, taught people to, to attack the civil institutions in America has a modern day connection. But let's start with the history first. Yes, this this was this blew my mind when I was researching the book. I think I was doing this at like 1 a.m. I did a lot of the research for this book after my daughter went to sleep and I like jumped up from my laptop when I realized <laughs> this and I was like, everyone's asleep. Who am I supposed to tell? <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up making it the beginning of my book. So when we look at the cultural institutions that are that have been compromised in our nation, it's pretty obvious. Like the media has been compromised. The education system has been compromised. A lot of religious institutions sadly have been compromised. The law has been compromised and they are actively, the other side is actively seeking to subvert the nuclear family. So we identify those things and we're like, okay, cool. Well, you take a little step back in history and you realize the communism or Marxism of Karl Marx, it went out of fashion after the Communist Manifesto Mm -hmm. died out because Karl Marx envisioned this global Marxist revolution that didn't really happen because discontented working class Mm -hmm. really wasn't enough to spark Mm -hmm. that. But then you have this guy in the early 20th century named Antonio Gramsci. He was the co-founder of the Italian Communist Party, and he was put in prison in fascist Italy. And while he was in prison, he was studying Marxism and what what made the Marxist revolutions that were successful, successful. And he accurately recognized that when a Marxist revolution was successful, it wasn't based on economic discontent. It was based on first destroying the civil institutions on which the working class relied. And he named, among others, the media the education system, religious institutions, the law, and the family. Once you Mm. see this stuff, you can't unsee it. But Gramsci's work was not prevalent in the United States for a long time. It didn't become prevalent until the 1970s. So here I am sitting, leafing through. Hang on just a second. 
the theory of mine, I don't know if this is true, because they lost in the 1960s, these Marxists lost, yeah. they realized this is not going to work, that we have to have all of them. And then in the 1980s, when Reagan came in, they still didn't have the boardrooms. And that's when they really started doubling down and getting the companies. Is that, is yes. that you think that's accurate? Yes, it is yeah. accurate. I think it it really did start before the 1960s, the infiltration of our institutions and these ideas being planted in different mm -hmm. places okay. in our society. What It wasn't something that happened quickly, right. which is why I think we're not going to be able to fight back against this immediately because it took 100 years to plant this. We're not going to be able to eradicate it in mm -hmm. a day. But I'm leafing through these prison notebooks that Antonio Gramsci wrote, and I realized on the front cover of the page, this is probably like the 15th time I had this book open, that the reason I'm able to read Antonio Gramsci he wrote in Italian, translated into English, is because of a man who translated his work. The man's name was Joseph Buttigieg. <laughs> yes, that Buttigieg. I... This is Pete Buttigieg's father, who ran an international fan club for Antonio Gramsci, translated these works. So it's not just that he's, uh, uh, you know, uh, been intersect by by heterosexual men that, you know, he's been oppressed because of that. He's probably legendary because of his family tie in the Marxist circles. Is well, you would think, I mean, you would think at the very least that some enterprising journalists would ask the Secretary of Transportation if he shared an ideological connection in addition to the biological relation to his Marxist father. But no one seems interested in that. Mm. Seems relevant to me. It but does. Um, it does. It blew my mind. I ended up just kind of saying, you're kidding me. You're kidding me a hundred times because it's, it's right there. So um, so he believes uh, taking down um, all of these things, taking down the nuclear family, mm -hmm. you point out there's five steps to doing that. What are yes. the five steps? So a basic nuclear family is comprised of five elements. Obviously, man, mm -hmm. woman, mm -hmm. marriage, sex, and children. And if you look at the history of our country in the last, since about the 1960s, each one of these elements has been the target of a concerted attack. From the sexual revolution, by the way, the term sexual revolution was coined by a Marxist, a Marxist named Wilhelm Reich, who believed that the only way to overthrow capitalism was to destroy Judeo-Christian sexual mores. Perhaps he was correct. So what we have, wow. attacks on sex, we have the feminist movement, I mean, you think about the feminine mystique. Everyone's heard of that book. The author of this book was, she claimed she wasn't a Marxist, but she was steeped in Marxist ideology. She was active in Marxist causes before she wrote this book that told women that they should be discontented as wives and as mothers, that they weren't reaching their full potential, that they should abandon their families and instead find fulfillment in a paycheck that turned women against men for the first time in American history you have the assault on masculinity that I think we're seeing in we're seeing today, maybe more than ever before, with the, the vilification of particularly straight white Christian men mm -hmm. being told that they're simply bad because they are straight white Christian men. And marriage, of course, conservatives and Republicans simply surrendered the institution of marriage because we were trying to be nice. We were trying to t not to tell right. people who they can live with. But. And I, I know this can be an unpopular opinion among Republicans because a lot of Republicans are like, well, people can do what they want. It's not just a matter of people being able to do what they want. When you redefine the word marriage, you are giving to the government Absolutely. the authority to redefine any word. Exactly. They become the arbiter of truth. And the arbiter of truth is just a nice way to say that you're giving them the power to be the authoritarian. Correct. Which is how we got to exactly where we are today. Yes. Where you can redefine man and woman and everything else. Everything. Everything. There's no end to it. Um, I, I, I remember when we redefined the word marriage and uh, leading up to it, my daughter was in college. She wouldn't speak to me for a while because mm -hmm. college had convinced her that I was anti-gay. On this, I've always been libertarian. I, I don't care what you do, but don't tell my church what marriage is and who I have to marry. I won't tell you who you can hook up with and you can make a little pact, but it's not marriage. But you can make that pact. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Man and man want to hook up. That's fine. But don't redefine marriage. You go 
a step further. It's important to say that's not fine. I think so. Yes. And I, like I said, I know this is an unpopular opinion among Republicans who are like, well, don't say that. You'll lose the centrist votes. Being a squish is never going to get you any votes. It's never mm. going to standing for nothing is never going to coalesce a passionate base who also want to fight for your values. Marriage is what marriage is. You simply you can pervert it. You can have government pretend that it's something different, but you can't change what the institution of marriage is. It's one of the unique things about our country is that we were founded on the idea that our government didn't come first. That there was objective reality first and right. our government was meant to protect it. And it, it and it, it if you're if you are looking to destroy traditional marriage, which we know that was on the you know BLM website and everything else, destroy nuclear family. You can't say that no, we're just extending that because you're trying to destroy that. It's your intent is to destroy the nuclear family. It is. It's also a matter of historical fact. If you look at if you look at the 1960s and the 1970s when the gay rights movement was, I guess, becoming more prominent. Some of the leaders of this movement, which right now they're not spoken about even among gay activists because they don't want to be associated with Marxism because mm -hmm. there are some people who really think it's about gay rights, but they organized their entire activism efforts patterned off of the Marxist dialectic. Instead of viewing their sexual preferences or their homosexuality as either how the medical community had deemed it, you know, a psychological disorder or how the church had deemed it, you know, a disordered sexual conduct. They were like, wait a second. What if we painted ourselves as being marginalized by capitalism? What if we painted ourselves as the victim of institutional discrimination? And once they did that, that's exactly what we see today. That's why even though gay marriage was redefined by our government, even though there are no laws that prevent two men or two women from doing what they want with each other, nothing. They, the LGBTQIA lobby, those activists still act like they are oppressed. They're not, they, but they have to continue to act like that because they're not really seeking equality. They're just seeking to weaponize some demographic that they can tell this demographic, oh, you're marginalized, you're discontented. So you need to revolt against, well, it's always capitalism. It's always, it's always freedom. It's yeah. always our government institutions. So you thought going, you know, the kids going back to school would be like a load off your mind, right? And now you're hauling the kids around for soccer practice and band practice and ballet and the homework that you have to help with. And you don't even understand the homework. I'm sorry, does this sound personal? Um, there is a, there's a time where we're all like, you know, summer break wasn't that bad. Good news, you can take one big thing off your plate right now by putting great meat on that plate from Good Ranchers. They have built relationships with local farms to source out the best 100% American beef, chicken, pork, and now wild-caught seafood. Right now, when you subscribe to any box with Good Ranchers, you're going to get two years of free ground beef. That's 144 meals that you're not paying for. Now it's back to school. Get back to basics. And be able to afford it. You lock in your price for two years. Subscribe and use the promo code Glenn and get $25 off your box at GoodRanchers.com. GoodRanchers.com. So can I ask you, why has this, why is this leading to so much pedophilia stuff? Why is it seeming that you know, the trans thing is seems to be imaged as you've got to have them in your children's life. You have to say to a child, we have to we have to show graphic things to young children. Something wholly inappropriate for their age and uh, and then tell them that you can switch, you know, and be whatever you want. You should have sex. You should be exploring Nobody, nobody could show you any evidence that any of that is any good. None of it. And then you add this pedophilia part. Why? Where is that coming from? What's happening there? The most disturbing part of researching this book was I read the founding document of queer theory, 
So as as we know, we talked about the principles of critical race theory, right? Telling white children they're right. racist or black children they're oppressed. That's the principles of the actual critical race theory ideology. Well, the transgender ideology, this stuff that we're teaching children in schools, that gender is on a spectrum, it's not correlated to biological sex, that they should transgress social sexual mor uh, morals, these are not a random assortment of just poison. These are the principles of another theory called queer theory. So I thought, okay, well, let's dig into this. What is queer theory? Who wrote it? What's the goal? Like, what is this? I read the document. It's written by a woman by the name of Gail Rubin. She's still alive today. She's active in academia, I believe. Uh, she wrote an essay called Thinking Sex in which she defines queer theory. She was she wrote the founding document and she lists all of these different things, all these elements of the transgender ideology as being part of queer theory. And then she takes it a step further. She talks about why it's necessary to sexualize children. She defends child pornography and she outright defends pedophiles saying that our society, and she wrote this 30 years ago. So thank goodness this didn't come, her prediction didn't come true, but she said 20 years from now, we will regret having put in prison these men who love underage youth. Oh my gosh. It's th uh, the most disturbing thing I've ever read. I had to get up, I had to take a lap because I was like, this is like reading something straight from the devil. It's a neo-Marxist theory. Marxism is an anti-human ideology. Mm -hmm. That's why it's going after objective truth. It's why its first direct object is the destruction of the family. I mean, the free market economy, again, isn't inherently moral in and of itself. It protects our right to have a family, to provide for that family, to worship the God that we want. The nuclear family isn't just a practical institution that was begot of capitalism, as Marx and Engels said. It is the earthly representation of Christ's love for his church. They're anti-Christian. They're anti-Christ. This is a satanic ideology. Uh, and I think it is a religion. I mean, it is, there is, there's doctrine, uh, there's excommunication, uh, there's sacraments, there's prayers you have to, I mean, it's the whole, it is a religion and they are worshiping at an idol uh, or an altar that they think might be something else, but it is pure evil. It is pure evil. And it's not just their individual choice to choose evil, which would make me sad for their soul, but they're actively recruiting our children to be yes. part of it. You talk about Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood was the one that came up with uh, Don't Say Gay, right? Yeah, to the best of my research, and I researched this a lot, I was like, what's the origin of the Don't Say Gay thing? It was one of the modern marvels of fake news in our mainstream media to hear the parental rights and education bill in Florida falsely dubbed as the Don't Say Gay bill. It was incredibly effective. And it wasn't just a phrase that someone coined on the fly and it was catchy. It wasn't something that happened on Twitter and then people caught onto it. The, the origin of the Don't Say Gay phrase was a Planned Parenthood blog post, which since we started covering this, they've removed. But you can still access it via the Wayback Machine, yeah, yeah. the Internet Archive. They described a bill in Missouri during 2020. It was a similar parental rights bill that doesn't say anything about prohibiting people from saying the word gay. They described it as the Don't Say Gay bill. And the reason why is quite shocking because you think, OK, well, what is why does Planned Parenthood care about this? Like right. of all the things like their business is abortion. Why are they focused on this? Planned Parenthood has become one of the largest distributors of transgender hormone therapy in the country. Oh, my gosh. It's their new it's their new. Avenue of blood money. Abortion is one. The mutilation of children in a different way. Those they haven't killed by abortion. They want to chop up the, the bodies of these children and is they need people to believe that. That conservatives are trying to prohibit people from staying gay to protect their own business interests. Is this, does this go back to their original founding? They're just, they are about population control. So, gay, mutilation of children, and abortion, what else can you do? I mean, you're, you're feminizing men, you're, you're just destroying the, um, the pool, really, of, of baby makers. Is that what this is? It's all tied together. I talk a little bit about Margaret Sanger. I mean, most of us know a little bit about Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. We know she was a eugenicist. We know she was a racist. I mean, she wanted to call birth control race control originally, <laughs> which 
tells you all you need to know, really. But she also, well, she wasn't a self-avowed Marxist. I mean, she was also surrounded by socialists and mm-hmm. communists and Marxists. She went, she, she abandoned her family to have an affair with someone who took her to the Soviet Union during, during the socialist heyday. And she praised the Soviet Union for how they, how they treated women, this communist country that was starving people. When, when you are associated with beliefs like that, you are tainted by those beliefs unless you are only associated with those beliefs because you are studying them to overturn them. Right. And this is the Planned Parenthood is what I call one of the biggest institutional groomers in our country, grooming um, young women away from being feminine, grooming young men away from being masculine, um, demonizing babies, of course, with their with their abortion business. Um, now this transgender ideology, they are destroying the nuclear family more effectively element by element than any other institution that I can think of in this country. Wow. Um, you know, when you say um, feminizing men, uh, masculizing uh, women, talk to me about the, because I, I grew up in the era where my mother was too old to be part of the 1950s mom. And she or she was too, too young for that. And she was too old for the burn your bra kind of thing. And she never felt like I mean, I remember my my dad and I talked about it. So my, my mother eventually um, killed herself. She was just she was just very sad. Um, and um, my dad and I were talking about it. She said, you know, my, your mom always wanted to have her own business. Uh, and she wanted to be a florist, and she she was very creative. She was like Martha Stewart. And um, he said, but Glenn, at that time, we didn't even think of that. We, I mean, I knew she wanted to be a florist. She knew she wanted to be a florist, but women didn't own their own business. It just didn't happen. So how do you bridge the gap between, you know, the women who are driven to do that, and then now we have this... Uh, trad movement, <laughs> which is a flashback to the 1950s. It's a and, disordered grasp at something that was <laughs> right. Right. How, where? Where? How do you bridge this? How do? You, how do we get to reason from here? Well, listen. This is a personal question for me too, because I'm here. I'm working. This mm-hmm. is what I do for a living. I'm, I feel a calling to stand to fight for our country. Right. That's why I do what I do. I also have a two year old daughter who I'm not going to farm out raising her to someone else. I'm not going to drop her off at daycare every day. I'm not going to have someone else educate her. I'm not going to have someone else instill values in her. I understand that the most valuable thing that I can do is shepherd that soul. True. And I am unwilling to compromise that even, even to balance with my calling of, you know, writing this book and doing my show and speaking to college campuses all the time. And I think it's, difficult for women to be able to listen to their natural desires when our call and their natural desires are often to be wives and mothers but there's especially in this day and age there's so many ways to to work flexibly to be able to sort of do both Mm -hmm, i mean mm -hmm. i don't want to be one of those people that's like you can do everything because no if you you look like you're doing everything usually you're cutting something out Mm -hmm. but there's a way to be able to um do some work own your own business do do your your ministry if you will while also Uh, fulfilling your vocation. And I think it's very difficult for young women to be able to listen to their own instincts because culture has vilified their instincts and told them from the time they were born that they were wrong, that they were wrong to feel that way, that they should desire to go into STEM fields if they want to meet their potential. They shouldn't be thinking about what their wedding is going to look like. They shouldn't be thinking about Prince Charming coming along and sweeping them off their feet, falling in love and having a family. And I actually find the TradCon movement really interesting because I think it is it is a disordered grasp at traditional values because they don't really have values that underpin it. But Gen Z is so interesting to me because they have realized that this feminist narrative, especially among young women, this feminist narrative doesn't make them happy. And they are unconcerned the way that millennial generation is concerned with what other people think of them. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily care what other people think of them. And so they're like, well, I don't want to work. Why should I work? I want to stay home. And so they're willing to do that to, and even to buck cultural pressure to do that. Um, it's my belief that you have to have some kind of underpinning of morals or religion or principles in order to properly understand the dynamic yeah. between a husband uh, and a wife without it being 
That's the difference between, you know, building your house on rock and, yes, and on sand. Yes, exactly. So I think I don't I don't particularly like the trad wife videos that you <laughs> see on TikTok because I think they're silly. But it is interesting to see that for for the first time, they Gen Z is actually saying, well, wait a second. Women are unhappier now than they've ever been before in our nation's history. Maybe it's because they don't actually want to go to work all the time. They want to make right. a home nice for a husband. Right. And I am very hopeful that these young women and the young men too, who are benefiting from this, are able to pursue that to its um, ordered conclusion and say, well, wait a second, what you're actually looking for is a nuclear family, a marriage, a covenant, Mm -hmm. and this is how we should do it instead of just a partnership. Right. With everything that we know about Planned Parenthood, and it just gets worse and worse and worse, you think about how many babies have been lost? 64 million American babies have been aborted. That's nearly one in five pregnancies end up this way. And even now, with the abortion pill accounting for over half the abortions performed, how are you going to stop that? How are you going to stop it? Babies are still at great risk, and the Ministry of Preborn and the Blaze are partnering to help save 70,000 babies' lives. We've got a good start going. But we have to do more. Preborn introduces expecting moms to their babies by providing free ultrasounds. And it works. But they don't stop there. They also just don't care about saving the baby. They care about saving the mom and the baby together. They also provide assistance to moms who choose life. So please, be a part of this ministry. One ultrasound can change a mom's mind. It is not a clump of cells. Just $28. But any gift will help. $140 $140 gift sponsors five ultrasounds. 5,000 sponsors Preborn's entire network across the country for a day. And if you have the means, $15,000 would buy an ultrasound machine in a needy pregnancy clinic. Tanya and I have already put a couple in to pregnancy clinics. It's so important. Please join me, will you? Dial pound 250, say the keyword baby. All gifts, no matter the size, a widow's mite or a new machine. Tax deductible. Preborn has a 100% four-star charity rating on Charity Navigator. Give with confidence, pound 250, keyword baby, or preborn.com slash Glenn. Tell me about, um, I mean, we have to have a, at least a couple of minutes of bashing Woodrow Wilson. Um, One of my favorite pastimes. Oh, yeah, so happy to find you. Um, when I first started talking about Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson, everybody... Everybody said, what is your deal with Woodrow Wilson? And I'm like, you don't understand. If you don't understand him, you don't understand what's happened. Because he's, he took apart the Declaration of Independence, said it's worthless. Don't pay attention to it. He hated the Constitution. He hated uh, all kinds of things. Huge racist and believed. Have you read uh, Philip Drew, Administrator? You no, read that? <laughs> but I'll put it on my to-read list. It's his favorite book. He read it like three times while he was in the office, Ugh. and it's horrible. But it's fascinating because it describes the administrative state, yes. exactly what is happening to us now. It was Woodrow Wilson's dream. He was a very bad dude. Very bad. Very bad dude. And it's fascinating because he told us exactly what he wanted to happen with the federal government. And lo and behold, here we are suffering under the dictates of Fauci and the FDA and the CDC and an over all these overgrown administrative agencies that many people weren't even aware of. They didn't think about. They didn't realize how the administrative state operates, that Congress is lazy, that Congress are cowards. They make these very vague Um, well, they pass laws that are very vague, and then they say, well, we're just going to give it to you bureaucrats to decide what we meant. Yes. And then bureaucrats that have been buried in administrative state agencies for who knows how long. They want to. They want that power. They're like, please, let me take your vague statement and make it as Marxist as possible. Yeah. And then we, as the United States, as United States citizens, are bound to follow these rules that they dictate like they're laws. I mean, this is not a free country. I would argue that this is completely unconstitutional. All of it. It's so unconstitutional. In fact, the Supreme Court made a huge error when they stopped enforcing the non-delegation um, doctrine. That was one of the biggest mistakes I think the Supreme Court has ever made. They've made some doozies, but that was one of the... The Reigns Act would correct that. It would. It can, it can be fixed, yes. but of course it would require members of our Congress to understand the problem and be committed <laughs> to fixing it. So, And take responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, nobody wants the response of everybody in Congress... 
They're all cowards. Yeah. Otherwise, they'd be standing up and saying, we are $2 trillion over our budget. A trillion more than we said we were going to go. How, how bad is this that we, th we projected a trillion dollars over budget and we're $2 trillion over budget? That's insanity. And none of them will say, I'll shut the government down for that. I wish they would. I wish they would. Too. Every time Republicans are like, oh, we're just trying to avoid a government shutdown. I'm like, why? why? I would love to see that. Yeah. We'd all realize how useless the government is. We would. People don't realize, I think. I'm not sure I even fully recognize this until Dr. Fauci came on the scene and he was like actively lying and spreading mm -hmm. misinformation and trying to boss us around, telling us we couldn't even have Thanksgiving with our families. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it was just so jarring, I think, to see this and realize that this idea of rule Big by the time. experts is actually has a name. It's not just Dr. Fauci. It's not just one egotistical, tiny little man. Mm -hmm. that it is technocracy. Mm -hmm. The rule by the experts or rule by science right. is technocracy. And technocracy, I unpack it in my book. One of the, um, there's, there's several people who propose the idea of technocracy throughout history, but one of the people that I found most interesting was a Russian physician named Alexander Bogdanov. He wrote a fiction book about technocracy in which he had people go to Mars or something not interesting. But the mm -hmm. purpose of that is they were going to change the civilization of Mars from capitalism to communism and use technocracy as a stepping stone. Mm. Ruled by the experts as a stepping stone because you and I are not allowed to question the experts because Correct. we are not the experts. Correct. So it's authoritarianism. And, and he admitted it's a stepping stone to communism. And wait until it's AI. All an expert has to say is the AI, quantum computing, you can't even understand it. This is the best path. Who are you to question? Are you, you have quantum computing in your pocket? Or you, do you have all the library knowledge of the entire history of man in your head? You, people will just be like, oh, well, the AI says. That, I mean, that is, that is around the corner. It's terrifying. Because we keep giving power to people in the administrative state who all they want is power and control and, you know, authoritarianism. You don't think they're going to use AI to help them on that? We you, know what, you know what gets me about AI is people talk about AI often as if it's this autonomous being, that it's like its own living entity. And I'm like... You realize that somebody had to write the code, like a yeah. hunk of junk computer doesn't run on its own unless someone puts it together and puts a series of numbers and letters into it that tells it what to do. Correct. And you can you can put a series of code in that's very impressive and makes it, this machine operate, but someone has to write that. Are you telling me that without knowing who's writing that and who's influencing the people that are writing that and who's paying the people who are influencing the people who are writing that, that that's not going to manipulate you towards some ideological end? I know. Please. I've, I've always said, don't fear the technology. Fear the people yes. running and writing the code. However, AI is now making leaps and, and jumps in knowledge that we don't even know how it, it works. And the scariest thing is there is this entity, if you will, that is this giant hive mind, and it only has one little spout. And all of these you know, um, AI people are like, no, we'll just keep turning that down. It's churning all down here. It's learning and churning. And they're saying, oh, but we're only going to let a little bit out. This figures that out pretty quickly, pretty damn quickly. Um, so, you know, the one thing I really loved about this, because I am so concerned about I, I'm not sure a society has ever gone this far and gone back to freedom and liberty. Um, we have too many emergencies coming our way, too many hardships coming our way. And without God, we'll never make it, never make it, unless we are rooted in our principles and values. Nobody knows the Constitution. Nobody knows the... If you just really understood the Declaration of Independence and you could carry that around with you that's our mission statement i know what we're trying to build because of that i believe in that let's build that the constitution is the owner's manual that nobody ever reads 
And because nobody is ever reading this, and because people are starting to say, you know, it's because of God, and things are out of control, you can get into toxic stew of a quasi-religious, fascistic sort of government that fast. And that would come from the right. You know what you're getting? You're getting a godless uh, horror show on the left, but you could get a really perverted country on the right that Americans wouldn't understand. Do you agree with that, first of all? I think so, yeah, because every person, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, has a, a propensity to want power and to wield it over other people. Right. I mean, hopefully you and I don't want to use that and understand Mm-mm. that it's something that would lead us towards sin. But And I guess we think of Democrats as being more prone to use that because they are godless oftentimes, but every person has that. Everybody does. Everybody, Everybody does, does that. So certainly, I mean, it's not really a matter of um, government officials of if they would abuse power, if they have the opportunity to, it's when and how. And that's true of both parties. What you just said is so important because you sound like the founders. I know the nature of man. And if there were better angels amongst us, where are they in government? Where are they? And uh, man goes bad. That's the point that I became a huge fan huge fan of yours and can't tell you how much I would highly recommend your book because you include in your solutions the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. That is the answer. If we will do self-control ourselves in our own life, if we will stand up and say, I'm not afraid of you. And you know what? If jail's good enough for Martin Luther King over the truth, then it's good enough for me. And I'm not going to be scared by that. People are too afraid to stand up. And I think it's because they don't know what's at stake. They don't know what they're fighting for. And, uh, and generally, people are mice. Yeah, I mean, our founders recognize what you're saying. It's why Ben Franklin said a republic, if you can keep it. Correct. And he wasn't talking to a tyrant when he said that. He was talking to a widow right. who agreed with his moral philosophy. I think Republicans have gotten very squeamish of being associated with religion at all because we are rightly skeptical of going down the path of theocracy. And I want to be very clear that what I'm proposing is not theocracy. I'm never yeah, proposing that someone be forced to go to church or someone be prohibited from going to another church. Yeah. I'm not proposing a state religion. What I'm proposing is that we recapture what our constitution intended, which is that we have a pre-existing definition of, of these words of objective reality, man, woman, marriage, morality, immorality, liberty, justice, and that we don't allow our society to violate natural law. You can ignore natural law if you're not a religious believer, but that doesn't make it exist less. Correct. It's still there. Saying that a man could have a baby is like saying gravity doesn't exist in Nebraska. (laughs) Yes, it does. (laughs) Yes, it does. Come to Nebraska with me. And we won't have a cohesive society unless we come to an agreement. And this is probably more... Yes, we're going to have dissenters in the Democrat Party, but unless Republicans come to an agreement that, A, we're not going to be cowards about admitting that that any kind of morality and all of our laws are based on religious morality. Our laws against murder are based on the idea that, well, it doesn't matter if a dog kills another dog, right? Right. Okay. Well, people aren't allowed to kill other people because we're made in the image and likeness of God. Because that person has dignity and value and rights that were given to him or her by by our creator. This is the, the foundation of the most basic laws in our society it are our Judeo-Christian. Judeo-Christian values. And if we get away from that, we are never going to be able to recapture our society because it's a different society than we are trying to create. How concerned are you with the movement of, I mean, it, the, this is in every way, this movement in America is a movement of darkness and death on just it's battery acid. Um, on everybody. In Canada, they're ahead of us. And the things that are happening where they're putting uh, uh, parents in prison because they won't affirm the child's gender and said, honey, I don't think you should take those hormones. 
Oh, dad is in prison. We tried to get him on the show. He wasn't allowed. Not allowed. Not allowed. Not allowed. How close are we that to, to that here, do you think? They're trying to pass it in California as I know, we speak. it's a signature away. Yeah, and a signature that's going to happen. Yes, it is. It's, it's coming here, and I don't say this to be apocalyptic. I don't say this so that people feel hopeless. I say this because this should be the impetus for us to pass laws against this, to reaffirm parental rights, to ban transgender ideology from any kind of governmental institution. There are things we can do. One of the things that, that I challenge conservatives to do in the book is not just think about ordering our society from the perspective of ordering ourselves and ordering our families. Those are good things. Those are necessary things, of course. But we have to be able to say not everything can be accomplished by the individual. Mm -hmm. Some things we have to do collectively. Mm -hmm. We associate the word collectively with collectivism, so we don't like that. But some things we have to be able to band together and use government to order these things. We're not going to be able to fight back against these legal assaults on parental rights specifically unless we also are legislating parental rights or acknowledging the existence, the unbreakable existence of parental rights into law, into the constitutions of these states. And you can't do states. that without, without natural law yes. or God's law, yes. which is what we've always been based on. Thank you That's so right. much. Great, great work. Thank Very you. Very impressive. I appreciate it. Thank you.